Our next speaker is Alyssa Freeman, who is at Idaho State University. Uh, she is presenting on behalf of a team of people. So that team includes Anna Granath, who's at Idaho State University, Angela Google, who's at the University of South Alabama, Ji Yang Jia, who's at Trinity Washington University, and Tina Carter at Middle Tennessee State University. And I feel like there's an MTSU and then everybody dispersed from their kind of thing going on there. Um, their talk today is how might you explain what happened? Fostering sense making in a biology lab through educative curricular supports for TAs. Thank you for that introduction. All right, I'm gonna jump right in. So in the context of this research, the ambitious science teaching framework was used to develop the lab curriculum um, that was taught by the undergraduate TAs. And so ambitious science teaching or AST describes a vision for rigorous and equitable science instruction to support science learning for all students from all backgrounds. And this framework is based on four core practices, investigating big ideas, eliciting students' ideas, engaging them in scientific practices and talk, and then also pressing them for evidence-based explanations. And in my research, I'm particularly interested in two whole class discussions, the elicitation and the explanation discussions that commonly occur within this framework and provide opportunities for ambitious talk. And it's important to note that this ambitious talk differs from traditional talk where teachers are focused on factual responses that they can evaluate as correct or incorrect. And this typically doesn't allow for all students to participate. Usually it's only those that are confident they have the correct answer. And it also doesn't allow for students to share their thinking or why they're thinking what they're thinking. And this contrasts with ambitious talk where teachers are asking open-ended questions that have a variety of valid responses that the classroom community can then critique. And as a result, all students can learn while communicating their thinking. And this can lead to the development of a science identity and also allow them to gain confidence to participate in discussions. And research has shown that students can benefit from participating in rigorous talk within the classroom. And this talk can occur uh, varying levels of rigor. And our framework is based on Thompson et al 2016. And it has three different rigor levels that can be classified from less rigorous to more rigorous. And so for rigor level one, which is terms um, and definitions, and so this is more conceptually based and often seen as students kind of regurgitating textbook answers. Rigor level two is descriptions, and students can be discussing their observations or their past experiences, and there's a focus on what is happening. And the third level is explanations. So these are student ideas of how or why something is happening. And ambitious talk in the classroom and supporting students engaging in this rigorous talk can be incredibly difficult, especially for teaching assistants who often have little to no pedagogical training. And so we were interested in looking at how we can support TAs in facilitating this ambitious talk. And the context for this was a general biology lab for non-science majors. Uh, the course was designed using ambitious science teaching with planned elicitation and explanation discussions. It is a standalone course requiring 21 TAs to teach it. And for a methodology, we use comparative case studies looking at four different TAs, Kay, Helen, Fred, and Tracy. And then we looked at them across three different lab investigations during weeks two, four, and eight. And one way of TA support that these TAs were provided with is educative curriculum materials. And these differ from traditional curriculum materials that solely focus on student learning, where educative curriculum materials are designed to support both student and teacher learning. And they can actually support teachers in developing three different types of knowledge. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, content, pedagogical, and pedagogical content knowledge. And so content knowledge refers to the specific subject matter the students are learning. And so an educative feature could be additional information that's not required of students, but will help the teacher kind of have a deeper understanding of that material. An example from this context, context was that TAs were provided additional information about worms and crickets for a lab where students were dissecting those organisms. Pedagogical knowledge refers to general teaching knowledge and an educative, educative feature to support this could be information about promoting ambitious talk through the use of talk moves. 
And in this example, TAs were provided with talk move or discourse move information from an ambitious science teaching report. Pedagogical content knowledge is a combination of the other knowledge types and is the knowledge that is needed in order to teach a particular subject matter. And so providing examples of talk moves that can be used with a particular concept or a discussion would be an educative feature. And in this example, there's a PowerPoint slide um, with corresponding speaker notes. And in this red box here, uh, the speaker notes are highlighting questions such as, what did you notice when you were startled? Or what do you think is causing this? So these are potential questions that the TA could ask students. And then later on in the lab, um, there was an area where TAs can actually think about questions they wanna ask students and also have an area for some anticipated responses they might see. And ultimately, educative curriculum materials can support teachers in developing all three types of knowledge. However, teachers and TAs engage with curriculum materials in a participatory relationship, meaning that they can engage and interpret the curriculum in varying ways. Therefore, it's important for these curriculum materials to be embedded in professional development. And we know from the literature about 10 different aspects for effective professional development. And today I'm going to focus on four of those and how they were provided to the TAs in this context. The first is sufficient duration, both in the length of each meeting and the number of meetings across time. And so these meetings um, for the TAs were every week and they met for approximately three hours. It also needs to be linked to a specific curriculum. So each of the meetings were focused on the next upcoming lab that the TAs would be teaching. Um, the TAs actually performed the labs while acting as students, while the PD facilitator acted as a TA. And then they were also encouraged to wear both their student and their teacher hat during the professional development to give them opportunities for reflection as well. And so when TAs were provided with these supports, in theory, we'd expect to see explanatory talk being observed in the classroom. However, we know this is not the case because TAs must engage with the supports, interpret the lab design, enact that lab design, and then hopefully maybe we'll see explanatory talk in the classroom. Today, I'm going to be talking about the TAs engagement with the supports in form of the annotations the TAs are making as they pertain to the three different knowledge types along with the rigor level student contributions in the TA's lab sections and in the PD meeting. And both of the annotations and the student contributions will be looked at with the four case studies. And so when looking at the data for the TA annotations, we can display it with the x-axis referring to the different TAs and each of the corresponding weeks we analyzed of the semester. And then the y-axis referring to the frequency of the annotations made by the TAs as they correspond to those different types of knowledge. And so here's the data for just one TA, K. But before we jump into looking at this, I wanna provide a couple of examples um, from her lab manual about these annotations and her knowledge types. And so first, content knowledge, responding to stimuli equals a property of life. And so this is K focusing on her content knowledge. Pedagogical knowledge, using the board to connect body systems based on the student responses. And then identifying things like heart rate, feel like crying, headaches and shaky, were all contributions of her colleagues that Kay wrote down during the question of what did you notice when you were startled or stressed? And when analyzing this data, we can perform chi-squared analyses to determine if the frequencies we are observing are different than what we would expect. And so those marked with the minus sign are where the observed frequencies are lower than we would expect. And those marked with the plus sign are where the observed frequencies are higher than we would expect. And by when looking at case data, uh, by week eight, she was making fewer annotations overall, but continued to focus on making annotations regarding PCK and content knowledge throughout the semester, but was making fewer pedagogical annotations during that week eight. Helen also was making fewer annotations by week eight. Early in the semester, she was focusing on PCK, but was making fewer notes of PCK during week four and week eight. Uh, but she was making similar frequencies of annotations for content and pedagogical knowledge throughout the semester. Fred also decreased the frequency of annotations he was making by week eight. He mostly focused on content knowledge, but that also decreased. 
Tracy was making fear annotations as the semester progressed as well. Initially, she focused on PCK with a few notes on content knowledge, but by week eight, this was switching to a focus on content knowledge with fewer PCK annotations. And so kind of overall, you can see that Kay and Helen were making more annotations than Fred and Tracy were. And so kind of a summary of all these annotation um, themes that we're seeing, all the TAs were making fewer annotations over time with Kay and Helen making more. Kay focused most on PCK, Helen mostly on content, Fred focused the least on PCK, but also had the fewest annotations overall. And then Tracy focused on PCK earlier, but then switch to focus more on content. And so we can do a similar thing with student contributions. And we can also include the PD um, meeting in this as well, since they were recorded and we analyzed those as well. And then also notice that this graph is organized by the particular week first rather than each TA, uh, but the Y axis still has it the frequency just of the student contributions this time. And then so here's the data for week two. But again, before I jump in, I want to give a couple of examples from this lab. And so for rigor level one, a student responding with the sympathetic nervous system would be an example of a rigor level one. This student saying that their muscles tensed up as an observation when Kay asked them a question would be a rigor level two. And then the student providing this explanation. It's like the entire worm has a musculoskeletal behind it. So without it, it wouldn't move at all. And then it's connected right to the digestive system. So I guess that's where it sends the energy forward to. And that would be a rigor level three. And we used a chi-square contingency table analysis to compare the frequencies of the student contributions at, at the rigor levels one, two, and three, observed for each TA to the PD example. And keep in mind that the PD is not a necessarily an ideal implementation, but was the example that the TAs were experiencing as a model of what these planned discussions could look like in practice. And so when looking at this data, Kay and Fred's implementation differed from the P PD example, while Helen and Tracy were eliciting similar proportions of each of the rigor levels. However, while their proportions were similar, the overall frequencies of the student contributions during Helen and Tracy's elicitations were lower than the PD example. And then we can use a chi-square goodness of fit test for an association between the frequency of student contributions at each rigor level observed across the five implementations. And so during week two, Kay was eliciting a higher frequency of rigor level one. Fred was eliciting fewer rigor level two with the PD eliciting a higher frequency of rigor level three. When looking at week four, the TAs and the PD were eliciting a similar frequency of the student rigor contributions. And with a chi-square contingency, tab contingency table analysis during week eight, Helen's implementation differed from the PD example, while Kay and Fred elicited similar proportions of rigor level one, two, and three contributions. However, the overall frequency of those were lower than the PD example. Tracy's student contribution frequencies were too low to run a contingency table analysis, uh, but she did elicit fewer rigor level one contributions. It was actually zero. And all the TAs elicited a similar frequency of rigor level two contributions, while Kay was eliciting uh, more rigor level three. And so here is a summary of the student contributions. Over time, the TAs were becoming more similar to PD. Kay and Helen tended to elicit more student contributions. Kay initially elicited more rigor level one, but by week eight was focusing on more rigor level three or was eliciting. Helen and Fred tended to elicit more rigor level one and two contributions, while Tracy consistently elicited rigor level two and three contributions, although these were fewer over time. Oops, sorry. And while it is interesting that all the TAs engaged with these supports and elicited interesting patterns, I want to take a moment to highlight Kay because it's interesting that she was able to elicit more rigor level three contributions than the PD during week eight. And so as a reminder, here is a portion of the graph showing how Kay annotated her curriculum materials where she tended to focus mostly on PCK. And when looking at her lab manual for week two and week eight, these examples show that Kay tended to use the questions I planned to ask and the anticipated student response sections. And while Kay didn't participate much in the discussions during PD, she was listening and quickly writing down all of these notes and contributions of her colleagues. 
And by week eight, she was still making quite a few annotations in her lab manuals, but she decreased her use of writing the anticipated student responses. And she instead, and instead of writing down her colleagues' contributions, she switched to writing notes about eliciting students' pre-existing ideas. And this is interesting because while she made fewer annotations related to potential student responses, during week eight, she was still able to elicit the more rigor, the higher frequency of the rigor level three contributions than the PD. And so it seems that it was really important for T, uh, case development as a TA that to write all of these annotations. And so for just some implementations, weekly TA meetings are ubiquitous, but rarely used as an opportunity to model discussions and anticipate what students might say and how TA should respond. And so when educative supports are provided, and especially if they're embedded in TA, or embedded in PD, TAs will try them out. And so they can get help anticipating what students might contribute. And although they may use them less over time, some like K will continue to use the ones that they find useful. And this work is giving us insights into how TAs use these supports and how that can relate to eliciting explanatory talk. And so further research is needed to understand how to refine these supports for TAs um, so they could foster explanatory talk in elicitation and explanation discussions individually. And tomorrow we will hear about some current work from Evan Barnes focusing on talk moves and effective ways TAs sequence the talk moves to elicit rigorous contributions. So be sure to check that out. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Everyone, let's uh, join in virtual applause. <laughs> Thank you for that talk. Thank you. And our first question comes from Dan Johnson. Do you think this approach to assessing comments could be used to evaluate TA comments on formal student reports? So like looking at the TAs um, for the student contributions or? Dan, feel free to unmute and elaborate. Yeah, I'd love some elaboration, please. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I, I like this, this strategy for being able to look at um, the points of focus. I mean, it's what I'm, what I'm thinking about is being able to assess where the attention is being placed. And when TAs make comments on written work, uh, one of the things that um, we're often concerned about is what are they paying attention to? Where, where's their focal point? And I'm trying to think about it um from that perspective how could you would you see this as a way of being able to do that kind of analysis i think you definitely could i would imagine you would need to alter it depending on what that assignment is and kind of your hopes and expectations for students to be learning out of that assignment but i think you could probably adapt it okay thank you yeah we have another question from beth schusler you had three hours and TAs doing the lab as part of your model. Do you have ideas about how this might translate to an hour long prep meeting and would it be possible? Yeah, <laughs> oh, I think that would be a little bit tough. Uh, the TAs did during this PD meeting look at some of the student work um, and spend time trying to make sure the grading was consistent across the TAs. Um, so maybe if you weren't focused on that as much. You could cut some time out that way. Um, but this lab was designed, or this PD was designed for a two hour lab. And so they usually took about two hours for it. Um, and I do know that they ran short a couple of times, um, depending on the labs and how many questions TAs had. Um, so I think it might be tough, but it might also depend on the lab context as well. So I have an elementary question that uh, I got stuck up on. The um, PCK, I understand content talk and I understand pedagogy talk. I was not clear on what PCK was. Yeah, so it's kind of, oh, sorry. Yes, it's kind of like a merging of the two. So in order to teach a particular subject matter, teachers need to know the content, but they also need to know how to teach it. And so this is kind of PCK is kind of like a merging of those two and how like to use best practices to teach whatever subject or content that might be. Does that help? And, and, um, I guess I can't imagine how you 
it might be difficult to score it, right? How do you put it in those three separate categories? Yeah, it is a little bit challenging, <laughs> uh, but through lab meetings and working with my lab group, it helped a lot. Um, and then there's also quite a bit of literature, um, particularly like Davis and Krajic um, in Michigan. They did a lot of work with this that um, helped immensely. Okay. And we have another question from Judy Ridgway. Might TAs be using the different educative supports even though they may not be annotating their work to indicate that they were using the educative supports? In other yes. words, are the annotations a good measure of their use of the educative supports? Yeah, it might not be a perfect use of their, or a perfect indication of their use of the supports, um, but considering it's what we have um, and we don't know what they're doing outside of the PD meeting. And so that makes it a little bit tough. Um, when I'm watching the PD, I can watch and see them right usually. Um, and so I know that they're using it most often during the PD meetings, but there is some additional notes that I can't correlate. Um, and even if they're not making notes, um, yeah, so that is a limitation. Well, thank you for answering those questions. That brings us yeah. to the end of, uh, of this, this talk. Um, you can put the hook away. And, <laughs> and if anyone has questions, you can always reach out to our speakers.